the intrigue of departure. The past five weeks have led us to today, Palm Sunday. Last week, Kirk mentioned how the Gospels really slow down the portion of Jesus' life here. If Facebook had been around in Jesus' time, in our memories feed, we'd see Jesus headed to Jerusalem with people rejoicing, waving palm leaves. There'd be lots of posts about Jesus the Messiah was here, and we'd see statements how he's coming to take over and bring the kingdom. In Matthew's Facebook feed, he would have the mother of James and John asking Jesus for a huge favor for her sons in the kingdom. She wanted them to be on each side of, sit, seated on each side of him. But Jesus ends his answer with, he who wants to be great must be a servant, emphasizing the attitude of putting others before self, and that he'd come to serve. He would later demonstrate being a servant by washing the disciples' feet. Matthew and Mark would both have um, the post of Jesus healing the blind man. Now John would have Mary anointing Jesus' feet, symbolically preparing him for burial. We have to remember, we have to remember this is a significant time of the year. Jerusalem was bursting with people. Families were bringing their lambs to be sacrificed for the Passover, which was a time where they were remembering when God had taken Israel out of Egypt. Ultimately, the Passover symbolized Jesus as our sacrificial lamb. In addition to the people who were entering Jerusalem, there's a buzz as a large crowd gathered to see Jesus and Lazarus who Jesus had just raised from the dead a few days before. Before we look at what Luke had in his Facebook feed, let's pray. We come thankful to you, Almighty God, for the gifts this coming week represents. We thank you that we know Jesus as our King and Savior. We've sung praises and worship to you. Open our hearts and minds to the message you have for each one of us individually. Let the words of your scripture take root in our hearts that we might grow to know you more. In Jesus' name, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Today's text will be Luke 19, and we're going to go back a little bit more 11 through 40, but the main text is 28 through 40. The Palm Sunday story or account begins in verse 28. After he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. After he had said this, what did he say? I mean, we can assume, but what did he say? Luke links Jesus' entry to the parable of the minas, and some call that pounds. So let's look at what Luke said in verse 11. Jesus told a parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So the people were really expecting the kingdom of God to be right now. The Jews had waited so long for the Messiah. Their desire to be out of Roman rule clouded their understanding of who Jesus was. Have you struggled to correct someone's thinking? Maybe a child that had it in their mind, you were going to do something a certain way. I remember Jennifer being upset that high school wasn't what she expected. It wasn't like 90210 that she'd been watching growing up. Sometimes life just doesn't happen the way we expect it to. Jesus was in this situation. People had expectations of him, especially since he'd raised Lazarus. They expected him to establish his reign right then. In Luke's account, Jesus tells a parable to correct their impression that the kingdom of God would be right away. Let's consider what he said in this parable and how it links to what we know of Palm Sunday. As Curtis read, a nobleman went away to be crowned king. Then, calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, and said to them, engage in business until I come. Notice they were told to engage in business. 
Some translations say invest. The word engage stood out to me. As we've heard a lot in the last few years about engaging the neighborhood and those we meet, when I thought of business, I thought of the business of being the church, sharing God's love and making him known. I also noticed that the servants were all given the same resources available to engage in business. God is not a respecter of persons. His love is available for all of us. And his sacrifice of forgiveness is for all of us. We heard in the reading how the servants' engagement and gain determined the number of cities they would manage. But one servant returned only what he'd been given. He didn't engage out of fear of the nobleman and fear of losing what he'd been given. His perception of the nobleman and fear of losing what he had kept him from gaining anything. How many times do we read in scripture, do not fear? When I searched it, the phrase came up 99 times in the New Revised Standard Version. Fear kept this servant from engaging, and he had gained nothing. There's more to the parable. I encourage you to read it later on your own. Now that we have a feeling of what Jesus had just been saying, let's see how it relates to the Palm Sunday account. Jesus Jesus is not coming to Jerusalem to become king, just as the nobleman in the parable did not go to a distant country to become a nobleman. Jesus is already king. Jesus didn't enter Jerusalem in the manner of other kings at his time. Even generals would have worn a crown of laurel, riding on a chariot or a war horse. Jesus entered on a humble colt and ends up wearing a crown of thorns. Jesus' manner of entering symbolizes his victory points to a royal power from a different source not a military victory. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is not his entry into a royal power. This takes place when he ascends to the Father. Jesus' entry equates to the departure of the nobleman. Jesus is not entering the city as a place of arrival. Jerusalem is to be his place of departure. Luke has written a section of about 10 chapters of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. In chapter 9, verse 51, it says Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He ends the journey with his own exodus, knowing his death and crucifixion will take place in Jerusalem. Now, looking at the beginning of the entrance account in verse 28, after telling the story or parable, Jesus went on to Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. If you would, pretend with me. Let's put us in the story. Consider we stand here on Palm Sunday in the story at the entrance of Jesus' crucifixion and death. Look at this account as disciples. We are his disciples who are called to enter gates with him. He sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. Luke begins by telling us that Jesus sent two disciples. Now, typically, Luke gives a whole lot more details, but he keeps the identity of these two hidden, and the other gospels don't name them either. It might be two of the twelve or two disciples following him in general at that time. For today, the two disciples are you and me. He invites his disciples to be involved, to participate in what he's doing. And these two disciples are called to participate as disciples who are sent. Sent to do what? 
They are sent into the village ahead. Often, ministry with Jesus is right in front of us. Instead of being sent off to a distant land, we are sent to the next town or person we encounter. You could be sent to another country, but the emphasis is on carrying out Jesus' ministry one step at a time. We don't want to overlook the many opportunities Jesus gives us to participate in his sending ministry all around us. The village ahead may be your mate, your coworker, a friend, a neighbor. Maybe Jesus sends you to a village ahead of you located in the grocery store or gas station on your way home. Whatever village you encounter, the ahead of you may be a place Jesus is calling you to serve him. The two disciples are serving Jesus in a specific way. They seem to be aware of how they are serving as they return with excitement, throwing their cloaks on the colt and set Jesus on it. They obviously knew scripture. They knew how untying a new colt that had never been ridden was a sign full of messianic expectations. They knew Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples know they are sent ahead as a witness to who Jesus is. The words in Jesus' instructions, along with the actions they are told to take, point to Jesus as Lord. It's important for us to know the word as in Christ and scripture. I encourage you this week to read about what we call Holy Week. Let his word bring deeper meaning as we rehearse his journey to the cross. Jesus tells them to untie a colt. Luke mentioned the detail of tying and untying five times. There must be something significant to this act. Look at a couple of details about the colt. The colt is tied up. He's told them they will find a colt tied, tied there. Remember, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to the cross. He's about to untie all creation from the bounds of sin. Jesus is the one who will set the captives free. The disciples in this act will serve as a witness to who he is and what he will do on the cross. We too will find colts tied in the villages ahead of us that need to know who Jesus is. People who need to know that he is the one who sets them free. The colt is untied for the purpose of being brought to Jesus. Likewise, our serving acts have a greater end. Can you think of someone who needs to be free, maybe from addiction, destructive habits, or wrong thinking? How might our love and encouragement help bring someone to know Jesus' saving grace? Jesus gives them words to say as they untie the colt. If someone wants to know why they're untying the colt, they are to say, the Lord needs it. Notice the words and actions go together. The colt is untied for the Lord. Setting the colt free to roam the hills would be another kind of bondage. The colt is made to have a master. People are set free, but not just from something, but for something. We've been set free. You might think of what personally you've been set free from. Have you considered that you've been set free for something? Jesus doesn't explain all the details of symbolism, and we're using analogies here to help us look at the realities Jesus brings to his departure we know he's always intentional. Let's look at another detail concerning the colt. The colt had never been ridden. That means it is a new colt that's master had not broken in. Trying to ride an unbroken animal will typically end up the way bulls react at a rodeo. They don't want anyone or anything on their back, and they will buck and kick until the rider has been removed. Jesus did not choose a broken colt. This can serve as a witness to who Jesus is and what he is doing. He is Lord. Jesus' death, 
will not end his ministry. He's not writing to the end. There will be a resurrection that ushers a new creation. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a symbol of the newness he brings to all creation. Notice the owner didn't resist the disciples in tying the colt. He gave up what the Lord had blessed him with. The Lord needs it. Jesus as Lord means that we become stewards, not owners. When the Lord comes calling as stewards, we will have no problem letting go of what's been given in our care. The two disciples, like you and I, are sent ahead as witnesses to who Jesus is and what he has done. We witness with the words Jesus gives us to speak, along with actions that confirm his words. Jesus is Lord, and we have the privilege to participate in his ministry by bringing others to him by word and deed. But there's another calling we have as disciples. Let's look further into Luke's account. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise him joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Now John's version has Hosanna, meaning say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. The passage has a theme of worship running through it. There's no hesitancy from the disciples regarding how odd their mission may seem. They are obedient to every word Jesus speaks to them. They do it joyfully, gathering others to sing praises to the Lord. This is what it means to be a disciple of the Lord, who is king of all kings. Everything we do is done as an act of joyful worship. Jesus didn't have to tell any of them to spread their cloaks and sing praise. The presence of the Lord brings out a response of worship from those who know him, who know who he is, and who they are in him. This account is all about Jesus' departure, his soon coming crucifixion and death. Luke wrote it in a joyful worship tone. This too is our response to knowing the Lord, even now as we live between the times of his departure and his return. That's what we see in the parable we looked at in the beginning. The faithful servants take all that's given to them and serve as stewards who trust in the Lord and his promised return. But the parable had one servant who thought the master was a harsh man. He did not respond as one who trusted the character and word of his master. Luke has one more detail to share. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Jesus' approach to the city is met with resistance. It comes from the Pharisees, the same opponents who've been resisting him the whole journey to Jerusalem. Just like the citizens in the parable who rejected the nobleman, the Pharisees are not excited about Jesus riding in as a victorious king they must answer to. They'd rather have their own rules and regulations to keep people bound to them. They also do not want the shouts of praise to reach the ears of the Roman authorities whom they'd cozied up with. A triumphant entry of a new king would end what little control they thought they had. There is no worship on their lips or joy in their hearts. Notice how they oppose Jesus. They go after the disciples. They order Jesus to command the disciples to stop being worshipers and witnesses. Everything the disciples are doing points to Jesus as true Lord and King. We can expect the same today as true disciples who follow the Lord. Those who want to keep people tied down for their own purposes will resist those who follow Jesus who sets them free. But Jesus has words for them. I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Jesus stands at the gate as king, and he can't be stopped. He will enter the city 
as its only Lord and King, and death itself will not prevent him from bringing life and freedom. Even if the whole world falls silent at his departure, the sound of the rolling stone from the tomb will shout his victory. Perhaps Luke intends to leave us with a lingering question. If Jesus is truly our Lord and Savior, even at the gates of his own departure, how could his followers be silent? How can we, his followers, be silent? After all, he is a returning king. During this coming week, as we prepare to celebrate Jesus' resurrection, take time to study what he experienced. He willingly entered Jerusalem. He willingly went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He willingly allowed soldiers to take him, and he willingly humbled himself unto death that we, you and I, would be saved, would be adopted children of God. So in the upper room, he shared a last meal with the disciples. He told them he eagerly desired to eat this Passover with them before he suffered. Put yourself there with him. He took the bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then later he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Great Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Jesus' sacrifice. We come thinking of Palm Sunday, the joy of his coming as king, and we do look forward to his return again. We also acknowledge his sacrifice, and we can only barely understand how that was for him. We thank you that you gave us the elements, the bread and the fruit of the vine to remember him, that each time as we take those and we can remember his sacrifice for us and your love. I pray your blessing as we protect and remember. Let our communion with you and with each other grow deeper and richer. In Christ's name, amen. Until he returns. Jesus asks us to remember what he's given us, to remember that he willingly gave his life for us. We have an open table here at Grace Communion Derby. We believe God's love is for all. In partaking in this communion, we commune with our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and each other as his body. We experience his love. And we remember, come as you are led, and let's remember.